So I'm just going to ask members of the Board of Health to take their seats as we're going to get started in a moment. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we officially have quorum, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, before the, the beginning formal remarks, let me acknowledge off the top that this is a special meeting of our Board of Health in response to the provincial budget. Uh, it is unfortunate and in some ways unprecedented that we are meeting on this urgent of an occasion in this forum here in the Council Chambers to respond directly to a potentially not just disturbing but dangerous proposal that has arisen from the provincial government. Uh, and at this point, as we begin, I'd like to formally welcome everybody to meeting five of the Board of Health, to members of the board, uh, and to members of the public. Uh, for those who are following online, you can follow the agenda and the debate on your computer, your tablet, or your smartphone at toronto.ca slash council. And of course, the Board of Health acknowledges the land we are meeting on as the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with Mississaugas of the Credit. This special meeting of the board is scheduled, as I've said, under unprecedented circumstances to respond to the budget. Uh, members of the board, as this is a special meeting under the Board of Health's procedures bylaw, the board may only consider business on the agenda, so there will not be new items of business. Uh, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Contra Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, um, I'm going to start with presenting a motion to excuse the absence of Ashna Bowery to the clerks, if that can be put on the screen. All right, that motion is moved. All those in favor, opposed if any, that carries. So the order for which we are going to proceed today, we have a presentation from our medical officer of health. Admittedly, the budget only came out uh, late on Thursday afternoon, so they have rushed to bring us the information that's in front of us. Following the presentation from staff, we're then going to proceed to deputations before going back to ask questions of staff. Uh, I would just note off the top to members of the board uh, that many of you, I know, are seeing patients and have appointments starting at 3 p.m. And so in this interest of time, I will keep a close eye on the clock for quorum. Uh, with that, um, two housekeeping items as we are sitting in the council chambers. When, when we get to the point of speaking and asking questions, you will raise your hand. You're not signing up to using the buttons to sign up to question. You can raise your hand as we normally would, but you do have a microphone there on off to speak, just like if we were in committee. Uh, and also there are washrooms often reserved for councillors and staff that are open to everybody, which are just behind me here if you're looking. Don't go downstairs or down the hall. Uh, with that housekeeping, I'm going to turn it over to our medical officer of health, uh, Eileen. Great. Is the microphone on? Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the Board of Health, for assembling for this special meeting. We certainly appreciate uh, your willingness to be here on short order. I'm going to take you through a very quick presentation uh, on the Ontario Budget uh, 2019 and the impacts on Toronto Public Health. But before we launch into this conversation, I should advise you that part of the presentation and the first part of the presentation will focus on the current state of public health as it is, to provide you with, I think, with what I think is valuable context to understand that which the provincial government has put forward and handed down in its most recent budget announcement. Hang on a second. We're okay. So here we go. Just to give you a sense as to what the current status of public health in Ontario is, uh, there are currently 35 local public health units across the province. And there are three different governance models for the various health units across the province. Uh, we have a unique model here in Toronto in that we're a, a semi-autonomous board 
but there also exist boards of health across the province that are autonomous and those that are, are formed as a part of single tier and or regional government. But suffice it to say that the 35 local public health uh, units across the province are in fact uh, you know, tied and operate strongly within the context of local municipalities. Just to give you a high level summary as to what the responsibilities and obligations are for local public health units, there are many, but they're generally summarized within the Ontario Public Health Standards. There are obligations and responsibilities of local public health articulated in the Health Protection and Promotion Act, which is a uh, provincial piece of legislation. And indeed, there are 40 other provincial acts that delineate obligations and responsibilities that local public health units have to the communities that they serve. Fundamentally though, looking at public health at the local level, as I've tried to explain, there is a significant integration with the municipality or the city or the municipalities that are served by the local public health unit and the day-to-day -day lives of the populations of those communities. Part and parcel of that, in order to actually serve those populations well, to actually protect and promote the health of those populations, fundamental to being able to discharge those obligations and responsibilities are strong links with local healthcare professionals and healthcare institutions, clear and established links with school boards, and there also has to be strong relationship and partnership with local agencies, community agencies and partners, so as to actually affect appropriate health protection and promotion for the population. When we look at the Toronto circumstance, we're talking about significant numbers of partners. Whether we're talking about over 7,000 physicians, 14 hospital corporations with many more sites, over 900 schools, and roughly 350,000 students in the city of Toronto, 50 laboratories, and hundreds and hundreds of community service agencies all working together to deliver appropriate health protection and health promotion uh, to the population. So turning now to the concept of the Medical Officer of Health, uh, this is the lead position within the context of local public health. And there are clear obligations and responsibilities and with them some statutory authorities that are conferred upon the Medical Officer of Health. So first and foremost, there's a statutory authority to address health hazards and communicable disease threats. There is also an important function held by the Medical Officer of Health to, as advisor to the Board of Health, to you as members of the Board of Health, and to City Council. And to give you a sense of the gravity and the importance of the position, it is a position that is not only appointed by the City, but that, set, that appointment as Medical Officer of Health has to be approved by the Provincial Minister of Health um, the Provincial Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, excuse me, and the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province as well. But fundamentally, when we look at the Medical Officer of Health as the lead of, of, of the local public health agency, the Medical Officer of Health, in concert with all the staff of that local public health unit, and in this case we're talking about Toronto Public Health, we together as a team are responsible for protecting the health of Torontonians. So the way it has been conceptualized um, uh, by colleagues at the Toronto Star is that the role of Medical Officer of Health is that of the people's doctor, protecting the health of Torontonians, ensuring that the conditions are there so that Torontonians can lead healthy, productive lives. And indeed, uh, this is um, <coughs> Uh, an important role. Turning over to you in your capacity as members of the Board of Health and what the role of city government is, we do have a City of Toronto Act that delineates the role of city council and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Toronto does have a semi-autonomous Board of Health. You as members of the Board of Health have the authority to set policy direction and when it comes to budget, there is a relationship that occurs with City Council as well. So that's why the nature of the board is characterized as semi-autonomous. City of Toronto has important roles in respect of appointing you as members of the Board of Health. 
As I mentioned earlier, they have an important role in terms of appointing me as Medical Officer of Health. They approve our local public health budget, and they provide the, fund the public health staffing, the team effectively, that is charged with that responsibility that I talked about, about creating a healthy city for all. So turning now to the mission of Toronto Public Health, uh, this is something that you've heard me say many, many times, uh, that we have fundamental roles around creating a healthy city, and there are main, our main objectives are to improve the health status of the population and to do so in a fashion that reduces health inequities. We have to prepare for and respond to outbreaks and emergencies as part of our important role in health protection for our population. And if we are successful in terms of achieving those objectives, we contribute to a sustainability, to the sustainability, excuse me, of the healthcare system. So the simple way that I try to put this when I describe the role of public health, our job is to ensure that the population we serve starts off their life healthy and stays that way for as long as possible. And if we have a healthy population, we effectively have a population whose need for health care for acute services is reduced or at least delayed for as long as possible. Again, talking about our mandate in more specific terms, this slide articulates that which we are responsible for. We have key rules in respect of preventing the spread of disease, promoting healthy living, and advocating for conditions that actually improve the health status of our population and reduce inequities. We want to have a healthy population that actually has the smallest possible gap between those who enjoy excellent health and those who enjoy lesser health. We want to reduce that gap. We have a key responsibility. We are fundamentally scientists. We have to use the available science and epidemiological methods to monitor the health status of the population such that we're best placed to respond to ongoing and emerging health needs and threats as they present themselves to our population. Uh, this is a unique role. There is no other player in the health system that does this important function, and it is a key function of public health. We're responsible for ensuring that we're implementing practices and policies that enhance the health of individuals and communities. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a key role in respect of advising both you as the Board of Health and City Council in respect of health issues that have impact on our city. And as I've told you many times before, and as, we ha as we've had the opportunity to discuss, Public health provides great value. Great value and great return on your investment. And these are only two examples of the kind of return on investment that you get for each dollar that's put into public health. Every one dollar invested in immunization saves $16 in healthcare costs. Every one dollar invested in tobacco prevention, tobacco use prevention, saves $20 in healthcare costs. There are very, very few, if any, arenas within the healthcare system in treatment that get you that kind of return. This is an incredible uh, value proposition that's provided for by local public health. I'm, going to ver I'm not going to belabor the point on these slides. Uh, this slide and the one that follows essentially speak to the breadth and the scope and volume of service provided by Toronto Public Health in order to protect and promote the health of Torontonians. You can see that we work with many, many partners and we have significant service, uh, a broad, broad range of, of service that we deliver uh, a broad number of partnerships and agencies with, with whom we have ongoing and very effective relationship. And clearly we serve a great number of people, being the largest jurisdiction in the province. So turning now to the specifics of the provincial budget as it was brought forward last Thursday. What we've done is in these slides, in the next two slides, we're characterizing 
again, at a very high level, as the budget was just announced a few short days ago, uh, the specific impacts as we see them and as we know them and understand them premised on the information that was provided in the budget document. So with respect to direct impact, what, uh, what was outlined in the provincial budget uh, in, in terms of its impact on public health was adjusting provincial, the provincial municipal cost sharing of public health funding. However, there were no specific details provided in the budget document around what the nature of that adjustment might be. The provincial budget also um, articulated that the plan is to establish 10 regional public health entities and 10 new regional boards of health with a common governance model by the year 2020-2021. And finally, in terms of direct impacts as we can understand them from the budget document, the budget document projects an annual savings of $200 million to be affected by 2021-2022 through regionalization of the local public health units and to governance changes uh, related to public health units. With respect to impacts that I would characterize as more indirect in nature, what the provincial budget document articulated was an intent to ensure that public health agencies focus their efforts on providing more efficient frontline care, and it spoke specifically to efficiencies that would be obtained through um, you know, streamlining, digitizing, and um, coordinating certain back office processes. However, the specifics were not provided in the budget document. Other indirect impacts as we see them that were articulated in the budget document talked about the plan to develop a regional strategy to modernize Ontario's public health laboratory system, and finally, there was a comment made with respect to streamlining Public Health Ontario, and this is the exact wording, to enable greater flexibility with respect to non-critical standards based on community priorities. Um, uh, the, again, no further details were provided in respect of that comment, uh, but we see this as a little more indirect given that it has to do with a separate agency. So what does this mean in terms of financial impact for Toronto? Well, to give you a sense of the context, the provincial pub public health budget allocation, so that which is allocated to local public health from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care currently is approximately $750 million a year. And the current Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care contribution to Toronto Public Health currently sits at about $147 million a year. So, I mentioned to you that one of the direct impacts and what was stated in the budget document was an intent to reduce $200 million, costs of $200 million uh, to the local public health uh, uh, budget by 2021-22. This gives you a sense as to what is currently being spent across the province and the component of that which actually goes directly to Toronto Public Health. So just coming up to my last slide, Mr. Chair, what I'd like to just emphasize to the Board of Health is that, you know, as members of the Board of Health, you know, I would like to think that we've actually had and engaged in conversation around that which is public health. We are your advisors and we are also here to affect programs, policies, services to deliver such that Torontonians are able to enjoy improved health status, reduced disparities in health status, and to ensure that we as a city and as a local public health department are ready to respond to and, and we're prepared to respond to outbreaks and emergencies so as to protect the health of the population. In so doing these things, we effectively enhance the sustainability of our health care system and play a fundamental role in that regard in supporting the health care system. We offer incredible value for money. The return on investment for investments and resources that go into local public health is well documented and I believe well understood by you and perhaps needs to be better understood by our greater population. The challenge of course 
is that when public health works well, it's not always obvious. When you work in the realm of prevention, the effect of prevention is that it looks like nothing happened. There was no outbreak. People are healthy. They're thriving. It looks like nothing happened. But as you know, as members of the Board of Health, it was a significant something, right? The most valuable nothing that there is, right, is good health. No outbreaks, a thriving community. That's not a nothing, it's actually a very valuable something. So there is a significant value proposition to public health. And there are elements, there are key elements that need to be in place in order to maximize that value proposition that we provide as public health. There are key elements that need to be respected, enhanced, maintained, so that public health is best able to create the kinds of communities that we want to live in, raise our families, and grow old in. And some of these are articulated here on this final slide. Knowing what we know about the circumstances of Toronto, Knowing what our partnerships are, knowing where we have the greatest effect, I would put to you as members of the Board of Health that one important principle that should be maintained regardless of what happens as we go forward is that there should be one public health entity for the City of Toronto based on municipal boundaries. I've articulated to you the importance of the relationships that we have with our municipal sector so much of that which drives health, what actually creates good health, is not within the scope of the healthcare sector, but rather in the hands of, of those who work in the municipal sector. Elements such as housing, income, education, these are things that actually are, are um, implemented on municipal lines. There are also community partners and agencies who form an important component of that which creates a healthy community. So what we're talking about here is ensuring that those relationships are actually provided the circumstances that they're allowed to flourish and grow and really provide excellence uh, in service and excellence in the conditions. Being able to respond to local needs to actually address the specific needs of the community requires a local focus with clear local representation. And finally, I would put to you that accountability and oversight are best determined by a model of governance that actually reflects the population's health needs and reflects the circumstances, the unique circumstances of the community in which they live. So with that, Thank you very much, um, members of the board and other guests here for your attention. And I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davila. We're gonna proceed now to deputations before we return to our medical officer of health for questions. Uh, we, have, uh, we will have three deputants here today. You'll notice Loretta Ryan is on the list, though she is not deputing. Uh, we have, the first will be Dr. Robert Kyle, then Dr. David Mowat, and then uh, former Chair Joe Mahevic. Uh, Dr. Robert Kyle, I'll invite you to the front. Uh, Dr. Kyle is the President of the Association of Local Pel Public Health Agencies, as well as the Medical Officer of Health for Durham. Uh, you'll have five minutes, Doctor, and there's a clock on your left and right, which I'll begin when you, be when you start. And to members of the board, there will be a chance for up to five minutes for each member of questions. Uh, when you're ready, Dr. Kyle. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a copy of my prepared remarks, which we gave to the Secretariat to distribute to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Chair and members of the Board of Health, and I'll just read through my uh, prepared remarks. So good afternoon, Chair and members of the Toronto Board of Health and Dr. Davila, Medical Officer of Health, and your team members who are present. I'm Dr. Robert Kyle, President of the Association of Local Public Health Agencies, better known as ALPHA, and have had the honor and pleasure as serving as a local medical officer of health in Ontario for over 30 years. 
uh, as you heard with me is Loretta Ryan, who is Alpha's executive director. Alpha represents all Ontario's 35 boards of health and medical officers of health, and Alpha has been very engaged with the 2019 Ontario budget deliberations since January of this year. On January 25th, in the Alpha pre-budget submission, Alpha noted that public health is on the front line of keeping people well. Public health delivers an excellent return on investment. Public health is an ounce of prevention that is worth a pound of cure. Public health contributes to strong and healthy communities. And public health is money well spent. And I think Dr. Davila's presentation has certainly amplified that message. Furthermore, Alpha recommended that the integrity of Ontario's public health system be maintained, the province continue its funding commitment to cost-shared programs, the province makes other strategic investments that address the government's priorities of improving services and ending hallway medicine. On the same day, Alpha released its public health resource paper entitled, Improving and Maintaining the Health of the People, the contribution of public health to reducing hallway medicine, which has been shared with the Premier's Council. The paper was developed to explain the work of the public health sector and to highlight the important role that the sector can play in eliminating hallway medicine by reducing the demand on hospital and primary care services. As you may know, this work is organized in the Ontario Public Health Standards as follows chronic disease prevention and well-being, emergency management, food safety, health equity, healthy environments, healthy growth and development, immunization, infectious and communicable diseases prevention and control, population health assessment, safe water, school health, substance use and injury prevention. The paper concluded that the public health sector serves the people of Ontario to ensure that healthy people can support a strong economy providing a direct economic impact, coordination of responses to community health concerns such as mental health and addictions in partnership with community level organizations, reduction on pressures on doctors and hospitals by concentrating on the community, community starting at birth, and a significant cost effective contribution to eliminating hallway medicine. It is with the foregoing in mind that Alpha stated in its news release regarding the 2019 Ontario budget that it is surprised and deeply concerned to learn the government's plans to restructure Ontario's public health system and reduce its funding by $200 million per year. The reality is this $200 million savings is a 20% reduction in the already lean annual provincial investment in local public health. This will greatly reduce our ability to deliver the frontline public health services that keep people out of hospitals and doctor's offices. Uh, I go on to, or the news release goes on to comment on the expert panel. It's in writing and all I would say is that in its response, Alpha noted that public health initiatives show a return on investment and the health protection and promotion needs of Ontarians vary significantly depending on their community. Alpha concluded that it looks forward to receiving more details so it can work with the ministry and other key stakeholders to preserve uh, essential frontline health protection and promotion services. In closing, Alpha welcomes the Toronto Board of Health and its other members reflecting on the foregoing amplifying the messages contained therein and modulating them as they see fit. Thank you for inviting us to appear as a deputation and we're happy to take your questions at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I'll begin with uh, questions from Councillor Perks. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. Um, so I want to make sure I've understood something you said. Uh, in, in your presentation, you said that the proposed reduction, I'm not going to call them savings, the proposed reduction is 26% of the annual spending? That's correct. Okay. And uh, I assume that, you know, I, having been in government for a while, 
uh, you, you can't cut 26% without actually cutting some service delivery. That would be our, uh, our um, uh, take, yes. Okay. And if we reduce the service delivery, you're arguing that that will mean uh, more hospital visits, more doctor's visits? That's correct. And uh, hospitals and doctor's visits to cure somebody or to treat somebody are more expensive than the investment you could have made to prevent that doctor's visit. That's the case that we have made and you've heard from your uh, medical officer of health. So in summary, uh, the $200 million cut will have a negative impact, impact on the health of Ontarians and a negative impact on the cost of our overall health system. That would be our argument. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to follow up with the Ontario Public Health Standards. Um, this goes through the kind of areas that public health units That's correct. would deliver programs in. And are we seeing that some, are, or, or do you expect that some will be the focus of this reduction in funding more than others, or? So, so um, I think we're all awaiting further details from the ministry, uh, whether um, specific changes to the standards are directed provincially versus determined locally. We don't know. We're waiting for uh, details. To the extent that all of the standards are delivered by frontline uh, staff and to the extent that it's extremely unlikely that efficiencies can account for $200 million in cuts, then it's hard for me to and not think that essential frontline services, including the suite of programs listed uh, under Ontario Public Health Standards will be affected. But in terms of one, one versus the other, I think we have to wait for more details. But this is the list that the cuts would come from. That's so correct, that's correct. So chronic disease prevention, it could, could be, very well could be a, a target food safety again could be a could be a they're going to have to come from somewhere that's correct what would a 26 percent or it was it 26 or 28 i i made 26 26 okay. um this 26 percent reduction what would it look like in in chronic disease prevention in let's say durham durham's case that you might you might be more familiar so with. if if you did that across the board and you were um, proposing, say, a 26% reduction in uh, funding to uh, our chronic disease prevention program. Say off the top of my head, uh, that would be a 26% reduction of, say, $2 million thereabouts. So I can't do the math off the, off the top of my head, but it's a significant uh, cut which would b amount to, I don't know, eight or 10 staff, something along those lines. And are we talking less visits to, to clients? Are we talking less uh, money to go out and do promotional activity? So with respect to chronic disease prevention, there is a preventive component, which um, includes uh, public health education and so forth. There's an enforcement component, say with respect to, uh, to tobacco, vaping, cannabis, that sort of thing. There's advocacy uh, work and there's the provision of uh, say frontline uh, cessation uh, services. So it depends on the program itself and what uh, programs are uh, currently in place at a local public health unit as to what may be impacted. Um, can, I'd like to pick a couple out of this list and, and, sure. and ask you a very similar question to them around emergency management. Um, so th that, that seems to me something worthwhile for uh, our community to invest in. What would a 26% reduction in a public health unit investment in emergency management look like? Well, again, it would adversely affect your staffing and it depends how many staff you have allocated to that program as to what it would look like. I think it's fair to say that that would be one of your um, 
programs that don't have a lot of direct um, full-time staff assigned to it, um, so you would probably preserve the staff, in our case, Durham Region, we have two staff that work on this file full-time. Uh, full well, it would be ridiculous to um, eliminate those uh, positions, so you would probably make cuts in, in, uh, in other, uh, other areas. But I take your point, uh, emergency management is a fundamental uh, program of uh, public health and uh, if you were to, uh, to make a cut to this area, it would have significant consequences. And just, uh, just to be clear on the role of a public health unit in the case of, of, of an emergency that mm -hmm. would fall under this, uh, that is heat and weather related emergency uh, yes, it's heat and weather related out my neck of the woods and probably in Toronto as well. It's nuclear emergency preparedness as well. Uh, although not, not specifically in the program emergency management, of course we uh, respond to infectious and communicable diseases on a 24-7 basis as well and it's part of the, I would call the local uh, public health and safety uh, infrastructure. That was your okay. last Thank question, you. Councillor Lee. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Director Sue Wong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. Thank you. Uh, and Sue, if you want to press the button there. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Kyle. So I want to ask you, from your association, were you consulted about the, t the reduction of 35 health unit to 10 health unit? Uh, no, we weren't. Um, I think we all were bracing ourselves for a, a budget cut, but uh, I don't think we uh, thought that the cut would be as significant as it is, and there were no uh, telltale signs that um, there would be a reduction in the number of uh, boards of health and public health units. Okay. The second question is, I notice in the, the actual budget, it made reference to the government will be uh, to remove the back office, I'm qu quoting from the budget's document, removing the back office efficiency through digitalizing and streamlining process. What does that mean to you as the Medical Office of Health for Durham for dealing with those vulnerable constituents that you're trying to serve? What does this really mean? So I'm, I work for regional government and so we get a lot of our uh, IT, HR, finance um, services uh, from the regional municipality. So taking it for what it says, uh, presumably we would uh, delink ourselves from the regional government and then link ourselves to a new regional entity and have them provide the finance, the HR, the IT uh, infrastructure that we currently get uh, from, uh, from regional government. I think it depends on whether you're autonomous uh, versus um, semi-autonomous versus uh, regional government or single tier as to how difficult uh, this could be. Uh, for smaller health units, um, this may be uh, helpful. I, I, don't, I don't really know. I can only speak for Durham Region, but there would be a, a two-step process. We'd have to delink ourselves, presumably, from our current host regional government and then uh, relink to a new regional entity. Okay, my last question, Mr. Chair. Um, with regard to the public health lab, I remember the SARS. I remember Walkerton. So what does that really mean when the the proposed budget asking for modernization of the public health laboratory system, how is that going to transform or improve the services for you at the Medical Office of Health for Durham and for the public health agency? Yeah. So uh, the short answer is we don't know what that means. Um, we rely on private and uh, public laboratories for support at the, the, uh, the front lines. The bottom line is if there are any changes to the uh, laboratory system, um, as users of that system, uh, we will be directly impacted, particularly if specimens that we currently submit to the laboratory system 
are either somehow disrupted or there are changes in terms of timeliness, that sort of thing. I I'm sure that's not the intent here, but we just don't know what those words mean. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up, I have uh, Director Peter Wong. Dr. Kyle, thank you very much for your deputation. Um, as we know, reductions in frontline programs uh, affect the most vulnerable populations probably the most. So as Medical Officer of Health for Durham, um, how do you think this $200 million of savings are going to affect the disparities in health, not only throughout Ontario, but certainly in your region? Well, um, that's, <laughs> excuse me, that's a tough one. I think uh, most uh, public health units um, apply a health equity lens in determining uh, where they can, uh, where they provide uh, programming, uh, what populations um, they target with their programming, and uh, my, my hope and my expectation is that all public health units at the end of the day will continue to um, apply a health equity lens in terms of its own programming and services. But at the end of the day, if there are fewer programs and services, um, then uh, priority populations will feel the pinch as much as um, the general population um, despite our best efforts to pr uh, apply a health equity lens and other things being equal, uh, target priority populations who, who share a disproportionate burden of illness. Uh, thank you, Director Wong. And then I have Director Kate Mulligan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dr. Kyle, for your deputation. Uh, I wanted to return to the portion of the budget that mentions streamlining Public Health Ontario to enable greater flexibility with respect to non-critical standards based on community priorities. In your view, what, what does that mean and which standards might be considered non-critical? I, I really can't, uh, can't answer that. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on the Public Health Ontario laboratory system or the community laboratory uh, uh, system. So I really don't know what that means. Uh, pure speculation on my part would be um, maybe it's a relook at who does what, hospital, private versus uh, Public Health uh, Ontario, but I really don't know. And that would be best directed towards a representative of okay. Public Health Thank Ontario you. or uh, another laboratory uh, expert. Okay, thank you. Um, a a follow-up question around, you mentioned, you know, delinking from municipal governments and aligning with s some new authority. Uh, is it f a fair assessment to suggest that the direction here is a, is a stronger alignment with the health care system? And if so, what, would, what might be the, be the impacts of that shift? So um, I, think, um, I think the roadmap, although we're waiting for more details, is in fact the um, former government's uh, minister's expert panel on, on uh, public health. And the title of that report uh, made mention of, of uh, integrating with the uh, healthcare system. Um, I think what that means, uh, but it's I, pure speculation on my part, is uh, to the extent that public health uh, programs and services um, can keep people healthier, then, um, and you've heard from me and from Dr. Davila about return on investment and so forth, it means that the demand on public uh, demand on acute care services and the cost therein um, could be pre uh, prevented in the, the long term. So that's what I think integration with the health care uh, system uh, means. I hope it doesn't mean that uh, scarce public health resources will somehow be used in the acute care system to deal with sick patients. 
Uh, but I wouldn't rule that out because we don't know what the details are. But I can only refer to the uh, to what I know about the expert panel report, and I think it was all about reducing demand on acute care services. Okay. Thank you. I just have one last question. Um, with respect to the timelines uh, for this transformation that is being proposed, can you comment on the feasibility of uh, making this transformation given the timelines that have been proposed? I think the timelines, I'm just speaking personally, I'm not uh, speaking on behalf of Alpha, are widely over, uh, overly optimistic. Um, the, the creation of 10 new regional entities in our case, delinking and then linking and so forth. To my mind, this is a multi, multi-year uh, uh, project. And um, uh, in terms of are there going to be any savings along those lines and so forth, I just think it's overly optimistic, quite frankly. But that's a personal view, and and I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, Alpha necessarily. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Ryan, or Dr. Kyle, excuse me. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. David Mowat. Uh, Dr. Mowat is a two-time former Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario, as well as being the former Medical Officer of Health for Durham, uh, or for Kingston and Peel. Uh, Dr. Mowat, you'll have five minutes uh, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, today from the perspective of someone who spent 40 years uh, in public health at uh, all three levels of government. And my first observation is over that time, I have witnessed the waxing and waning of support uh, for public health. Uh, in cycles that start with a reduction in funding um, leading to the degradation of the public health infrastructure and then outbreaks of disease uh, followed uh, eventually by public concern and some reinfusion um, of funding. So this is not new. Um, you can certainly see evidence of that cycle in the reports over the years from Justice Creever, um, the Auditor General of Canada, and of course the reports on Walkerton and, and SARS. They've all borne that out. Um, we've also seen um, uh, that the changes to the cost sharing formula, that's a road we've been down before, um, including one period of three years w uh, filled with sequential changes which landed us right back where we had started. Um, so now we're seeing proposed changes in the Ontario budget, which will in undoubtedly impair the capacity of health units to do their job in protecting and promoting the health of uh, the public. Mm. When public health is working well, as Dr. De Villa has mentioned, nothing happens. We don't see headlines saying, child didn't get meningitis today, for example. Um, and we have uh, a, a mandate which is concerned very much with very long-term results. And many of the beneficiaries of our public health programs are people who would not have a strong voice to advocate for themselves. So all of these render public health subject to neglect especially when the fiscal uh, situation is tight. We have to say loud and clear that uh, public health is not just an expenditure, but in fact an investment. Um, it's well accepted that over the past century or more, uh, we've seen an increase in life expectancy, and that has been due to better living conditions and interventions of a public health nature. But there's also clear specific evidence. And just to throw some more onto the pile you've heard about uh, from the last two speakers, um, there have been a, a, a systematic review by Owen in 2011 showing that 85 to 89 uh, percent of, uh, of the programs that were looked at met the criteria for cost effectiveness, cost uh, commonly used in healthcare studies. 
and one by Masters in 2017 of 52 studies showing a return on investment of public health programs of 4.1 to 1. That's overall. Um, and certainly better than that for policy investments at the population level. And a Canadian study, Guyon and Perot, uh, linking staffing to population ratios in public health and the presence of local boards to improve population health uh, outcomes. So time is short. I just want to move quickly now onto the issue <coughs> of the potential impact of some of these changes um, and a response. Of course, you will want to shape the final form of policy as much as you are able, including the critical issue of governance, which you've all obviously already taken in hand, but also to consider how to accommodate significant uh, reductions. Of course, uh, health protection programs responding to communicable disease outbreaks and emergencies are usually the first thing that sp spring to mind, and they uh, must, of course, be preserved to a reasonable degree. But there must be a balance which doesn't neglect conditions which continue to be a great burden on our population <coughs> and on the healthcare system. I'm referring, of course, to chronic diseases, which result in 85% of all of the mortality we see in Canada. And in the case of, too, uh, obesity and diabetes, they're an increasing burden. Uh, we cannot afford to turn our back on these pressing issues. Um, so let me get to the point about this, or rather three points. Number one, these conditions are largely a consequence of how and where we live, work, grow, and play. Number two, the population prevalence of these conditions will not be reduced one person at a time. And number three, public health is the most significant player in population-based responses to these issues. And a reduction in the funding for public health will impact these very, very serious population conditions. So that's just a word on what now um, about... You're, you're just over six minutes. I ask, maybe you can... Really? Yeah. Oh. But I suspect there will be some questions for you. So okay. if, if you want to wrap in a sentence. I, I will wrap it up in uh, a sentence. There are opportunities here to uh, enhance the role of science and to choose evidence-driven priorities and programs to in address the very serious um, concerns we have about trends in mortality and mobility uh, in our population and in uh, addressing equity uh, as well, and uh, we need to turn to addressing them. Thank you. That was an impressive sentence. Um, so we'll move into questions. I have questions. I'm going to put myself first. Um, Dr. Mowat, you were the former Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario for which years? 97, 98, and 2013 to 15, I think. And, and is that, we refer to the Medical Officer of Health in Toronto as Toronto's doctor. Is it fair to say that the Medical Officer of Health for Ontario is Ontario's doctor? You performed that role? I can't stop you calling me oh, anything right. you like, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, what did we learn after the tragedies like SARS and Walkerton um, as it relates to public health? What are the lessons we learned? Oh, um, a, a great many. I was, uh, in fact, quite involved in uh, one of those reports after SARS, the Naylor report. Um, and what we learned, and we expected Dr. Naylor to come out and saying, this is all about managing infectious diseases. And what he came out and said was, this is about the infrastructure of public health. It's about the adequate staffing, the type and skill level of the staffing uh, that we have, our uh, system of governance, um, 
our system of um, information management and the application of evidence and science and a number of other things. And uh, if funding is cut, and it has been cut many times over the years, that will affect the ability uh, of uh, public health to do uh, its job. And so in that vein, there is a, comp there is a clear distinction between health care and public health and how those dollars are spent. Yes, yes indeed. Um, uh, we have a public health, as I see it, and the healthcare system have different objectives. Uh, objectives of the healthcare system uh, are to uh, improve prognosis, alleviate uh, pain and suffering, um, and um, conserve um, capacity um, at the individual level. And of course, this is absolutely vital work. But in public health, our concern is not within the, with the, just with the individual. It's about the entire society. And what we're trying to do, as you've heard from Dr. De Villa, is to improve the health status of of the population as a whole, and also to address the inequities in health status that we observe uh, within that population. Um, and we sometimes neglect those two, or the, there's a failure to fully understand them because we're so concerned with the other, the third, very vital thing, which is responding to outbreaks and emergencies. So, as, as the former Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario, beyond the search for immediate cost cutting, under what health rationale could there be to cut funding to public health in the province of Ontario? What rationale could exist beyond seeking a short-term cut for funding? Well, I, I'm obviously not included in uh, the discussions that went on leading up to this. Um, and, um, you know, I think we have to recognize that there are enormous pressures um, in everything that government does fiscally, um, including the healthcare system. Um, but there's always, I think, a, a temptation. And when I, I worked with Carolyn Bennett, I always used to remember she would speak about the tyranny of the acute. Um, and it's that we do tend, as human beings, to look in the short term. Um, and investment in public health really brings these uh, benefits that we've talked about, these returns on our investment, many years down the road. And um, it requires a certain amount of discipline, I guess, to say, we are not going to let this go. Uh, we are going to invest for the future. Um, so a cut in funding for public health impairs our health in the future, not necessarily just here and now. Thank you. Um, Trustee Donaldson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Mullet, for coming to speak to us today. I have a few questions. The first is, uh, how do public health units work with hospitals um, and doctors to prevent the spread of disease? Um, well, our work with um, hospitals um, it touches on a number of things. Obviously, the first one that springs to mind is infectious diseases. Um, and that's, I mean, I could talk about that for a very long time. Um, but obviously, um, hospital staff ob make observations about what's happening and they need, uh, we need a relationship between hospital staff as well as primary care staff and others, long-term care also, uh, to uh, uh, maintain surveillance of infectious diseases so that we're able to, to spot trends. Um, uh, there's also involvement uh, very often in the efforts that hospitals undertake to reduce the spread of infection within hospitals. Um, but it's not totally uh, concentrating on infectious diseases. I'll give you one example, is that there's a lot of interest in public health now 
in um, identifying people who are admitted to hospital for reasons related to tobacco smoking who are still smoking. Um, and, you know, how can we identify these people and help them put them into a system which is going to give them the help they need, uh, including, you know, access to pharmaceuticals uh, to help them quit smoking and to follow them over time. Um, and so that's a, a, another example of a partnership that's not infectious disease that shows public health um, and hospitals uh, working together. Thanks. My next question is, what does public health do that other organizations in the healthcare system don't do? Well, I want to give this answer with, uh, preface it with recognizing that everything, just about everything we do, involves other partnerships. Um, and particularly in the NGO sector and other community groups, as well as other professional groups. Um, and uh, Loretta Ryan sitting over there is a perfectly good example of, you know, as a city planner, um, you know, who do we work with? So very often it's orchestrating the people who are involved in a particular issue that is out, very often outside the healthcare system, um, which affects our ability to enjoy good health. Um, so um, if you can take the example of how we build cities, the built environment, for example. So that's, public health is not the lead, right? City planning departments are the lead for that. But there have been innumerable examples of those two groups coming together, together with N NGO groups um, who could be interested in cycling or the environment or anything, and working together to improve how we lay out our cities um, on the basis of an enormous pile of science we know that certainly links the way we build cities and uh, transport people across cities and health outcomes. And that's very solid science. And we're starting to move on that because we're working together with people, all of whom are outside the healthcare system. Thanks. Final question. Um, we heard in the presentation that health status assessment is a unique function of public mm -hmm. health. And I'm hoping you can expand on this a little bit more for our benefit here today. Yeah, well, when you go into a hospital with an acute illness, you would expect that the first thing that's going to happen is you're, they're going to listen to your story, examine you, and give you some tests, right? So why in public health would we just rush out there and do stuff without assessing um, what the situation is and understanding it? Here's a condition. How is it distributed uh, in the population? Is Over time, is it getting better or worse? Uh, are we better or worse than the people next door, and so on. Um, and to do that for uh, diseases, for mortality, for injuries, for risk factors, and for determinants of health, so that we have a complete picture of the health of a population. Um, and it's quite technically challenging and takes a, a long time um, but that's the nature of health status assessment. It's the diagnostic phase of practicing public health. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moen. Um, our, our final deputant today is a familiar face. I believe this is uh, his first return to City Hall uh, in a couple months. It is the former chair of the Board of Health uh, and past counselor, Joe Mahevic. Big Joe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Little Joe, friends, colleagues. Uh, it's great to be back here. Hello to everyone. Um, yes, I'm trying to stay under the radar, but sometimes I think it's important to speak out when there is a critical issue facing our city. And at the end of the day, all of us who sit on that side of the table are there because we love this city, and just because you're on that side of the table, it doesn't mean that that, uh, that love uh, stops. And I do think it's important at this moment for each and every one of us who have any sense of what public health is about and what it does, to raise our voice as a city and as a community to say no to these cuts and 
direct or encourage the province to think this through differently. In preparing for this, uh, these uh, few words, I thought I would uh, kind of review all those phrases that we have as human beings that say, you know what, um, we could do this now, but it's going to hurt us later on. So we have phrases like penny wise, pound foolish, pound foolish, or pay me now a little bit, or pay me a lot later on, or haste makes waste, or short term action versus long-term planning. The one that I think, though, is the best is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, because that's really what this debate is kind of all about. Um, the cuts that are being proposed, my math, uh, in dividing uh, $200 million of cuts over a $750 million budget is that the cut will be 26.666 repeated. That's the, that's the number, and for the City of Toronto, it'll be something like $40 million on an annual basis. That's not small. That's a major cut to the way we, um, we do uh, our public health uh, work. Um, and so the question is, is this wise? Is this the kind of thing that, uh, that we want to do? Uh, the Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Davila's uh, presentation was excellent. When you put a dollar into tobacco prevention, you save $20 on the other end. When you put a dollar into immunization, and now we're in a critical period around immunization, you save $16. I remember all those budget presentations. You put a buck in now, and you save, sometimes the presentation said $8, $10, $12 uh, at, at the other end. That's what we need to keep in mind here. If the Ontario government was smart, and if and as it is a fiscally very conservative government, you would actually do the reverse, therefore. If these principles are accurate, you would say, well, maybe you, well, using their language and their way of thinking, you cut on the curative side of health and put that money into the prevention because it actually yields better results. Um, I was, uh, I've been the chair off and on, frankly, uh, with, uh, with uh, Councillor Fillion for the last uh, 27 years uh, here in the city of Toronto in the, in the former city of York. The biggest event that marked the importance of those insights was the SARS crisis. Um, and you may remember, people may remember that before the SARS crisis, the funding for public health was 50-50. So 50% came from the province, 50% uh, came from the city. And Dr. Naylor's evaluation uh, with Sheila Bazer, people might remember her, um, they, we came up with the province with an understanding that that had to change, that public health was so important that the new funding formula was 75-25, that the province did not want cities cheaping out or being tempted to save money in this area, so they put in 75 cent dollars to make sure that cities and municipalities and regional municipalities would put in their share. That was for the protection of public health in the Ontario system. Um, and of course, that's important, that's so important. And just to give you some examples, if we had not had a strong public health system, when I started out, we had smoking rates of 25% in the province of, uh, province of Ontario, City of Toronto. We're down now to the low teens, somewhere around 10%. Hundreds, not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people aren't smoking, are living longer, are living higher quality, quality lives because of the work that we, we did, and we're saving the system money. Same thing with food inspections, the restaurant grading system, like what a system. We now have one of the world class dining establishments, set of establishments in the city of Toronto, and we know that you will not get food poisoning, you will not get sick from the food that you, you eat because of our, the work that we've done on that system. Vaccinations, herd immunity is at stake with some of the diseases uh, that are around. Flu shots, like a flu shot today saves a hospital visit tomorrow. Uh, communicable disease control, as I mentioned before. Nutrition, seeing food also as medicine, curbing type 2 diabetes uh, and all kinds of, uh, of other illnesses. So what do I think we need to do? Of course, and I know, I, I know uh, that you will put forward very good and strong recommendations of advocacy to the province. 
But as one of the de prior deputants said, maybe this is one of those cyclical, generational, educational moments that uh, need to be had every 10, 15, uh, 20 years. So along with the ad advocacy, I would encourage the following. Just as with SARS, when most people, they really don't distinguish between curative health and public health. To them, to most people in the general public, it is of one piece. SARS was a teaching moment, so we started to help people, help Torontonians tease out the difference between what you folks do and what the hospitals and doctors and primary uh, and acute care health system uh, does. This is a teaching moment for Toronto and Ontario. Torontonians need to understand the value of public health and how it is really integrated into keeping their life strong and curbing uh, early, early death. So I would say along with all the advocacy moments, maybe there's ways that we can find, use this also as a teaching moment to help folks understand that they do have control, some control over their health and that they can put in place systems to make sure that that health is even stronger. That's what I think the moment calls for. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, former chair. I was about to call you the chair again. Uh, questions of former chair Mahevic? I think you covered it all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're now gonna bring this into committee. Uh, and just a time check so people are aware, it is 2.15. Um, we'll now open it up for questions of the medical officer of health and staff. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and through you to the Medical Officer of Health, with respect to the uh, proposed cuts to uh, Toronto Public Health and all of public health budgets uh, across Ontario, um, I know that uh, we obviously are, are standing in opposition of that, and the, and the Chair has put a circulated motion uh, outlining our opposition. Uh, can I ask, what would happen if we are not able to reverse those cuts? Exactly what services are we saying goodbye to? So through the Chair, <laughs> sorry, Councillor Wong Tam, I'm you're right here. Just over Thank here you. to your right, through the chair. Uh, again, we don't know what the details are, and I think you've heard some of the uh, comments from the deputants that have presented today that there may be specific methodologies or specific um, plans that the provincial government has in respect of how those cuts are meant to be affected. So without the details, it's, it's, it's challenging to know, other than to say that clearly uh, it is a significant uh, impact on local public health and how that would actually be manifest has yet to be determined. And so we have heard about um, the the lack of public aware, or sorry, the, the public awareness campaigns and the education that a lot of public health does uh, with respect to preventative health. I think is it safe to assume that we will not be able to go out and, and be so proactive anymore? I know that you don't know all the program impacts, but I'm just curious to know what can, logically, what can we expect to see? So through the chair, I, I think logically we can expect to see a reduction in a number of different activities across public health. And again, depending on what the province puts forth, uh, whether they're specific around which, which um, where, where the uh, cuts are meant to be affected, how these, uh, I think that what's referred to within the document, the budget document is our efficiencies and streamlining. If there is a specific line item or specific areas of activity that they wish to direct those cuts toward, those have not been articulated yet, but suffice it to say that these are 27% uh, or 26.666 repeating, I believe was what we heard, is a significant proportion. Uh, and that's not a simple thing to absorb. And do you have any indication, I know it's been early days, do you have any indication of when we may be getting some of those details? So through the chair, no specific communications. I've certainly heard some conjecture that that should be coming through in the next little while, perhaps even the next few days. And recognizing that we already have approved our 2019 budget uh, based on certain probably reasonable assumptions of what has come forward in the previous years and carried forward, um, is, there, is there the opportunity for a, a deeper analysis on, on what those budgetary impacts will be, even if we don't have the... Um, uh, the details from the province is that is that work that your team will be undertaking 
So through the chair, we are trying to understand and to conduct as much analysis as we can in respect of the budget document, but without further details, it will be challenging to get much further. And I recognize that there are, are literally probably hundreds of organizations um, and I can think of a number of community-based organizations, uh, uh, nutrition programs, uh, the aid service organizations, There's the, the, uh, there, there are n hundreds of organizations that rely on grants from the City of Toronto, um, and, uh, and those dollars may not necessarily be shared by the province. But as we are faced with what will be uh, no doubt a, a budget shortfall, um, is the process for us to come back and to reevaluate once we have more details from the province of what services we have to cut and will those grants affecting those hundreds of organizations reaching out into the farthest communities that we cannot reach as, as a city, um, will they also be um, uh, at risk of, of losing the grants but also losing the service to those communities? So through the chair, as is our practice, if there are specific community service levels that will be impacted, that would certainly be a discussion that we would want to bring forward to the board at, the time, at that time. And finally, um, my question around just coming back to the budget for, by way of example, um, will a possible outcome in, in this year uh, be the Board of Health coming back to City Council, uh, asking City Council to bridge the budget shortfall is that it will that be on the table because once we once the money is evaporated and gone uh, we don't want to lose the services and even as you sort of rifle through what's a priority and what's not um, you're still most likely will still be short will the will there be a request coming back to City Council for money and do you have a sense of what that quantum would look like so through the chair uh, as we become more familiar and as we learn greater details in respect of what the budget document means um, and what the specific implications are, we'll certainly bring that forward to the board. However, I, I believe it's within the discretion of the board um, and that will be the board's decision to make whether there is an ask of City Council. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Any other questions of um, Kate Mulligan? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Deville, I'm going to ask a couple of the questions that I uh, posed earlier. With respect to, uh, you know, a potential alignment with the health system, uh, change in the number of health units, can you describe what the impacts might be uh, of uh, aligning with the health system and potentially delinking from municipal and community? Well, it's uh, through the chair. It's um, you know difficult to predict the future, and I think I've learned in this position that I try not to engage in prediction. It's a complicated game. However, uh, I think we can look at the experiences of other jurisdictions um, that have sought to align public health or include public health uh, and um, more closely or, or effect a closer relationship between public health and the health care system. And I, I think that uh, the deputant, Dr. Mowat, spoke very specifically around the tyranny of the acute and the challenge that exists therein uh, because it is simply a question of human nature. It is very challenging to have, and I believe the term that was used was discipline, to really affect those resources, to invest those resources uh, in longer term solutions. Solutions that are, require an investment now, not an expenditure but an investment now, but don't actually provide benefit until at some point in the future. But I would put to the Board of Health that it's exactly those kinds of investments that create health within the context of a community. <laughs> a follow-up question, is there an appetite uh, or have the, has there been consideration given by staff to the role of Toronto Public Health in the Ontario Health Teams uh, and other partnerships given the partnership uh, work that is already ongoing here? So through the chair, the short answer is yes. We have uh, definitely been approached and are engaging with other partners in the health system. We do see that there is a continuum of care, right? There is a very critical role to be played by the health care system, whether we're talking about acute care, long-term care, primary care providers. There is a clear value and an importance to health care. However, that which actually creates health within our communities is so much more than that. And we know that that's where public health comes into play. 
that we actually play a role in terms of creating the conditions that allow people to start off life healthy and to stay that way for as long as possible over and above our important role in respect of preparing for and responding to outbreaks and emergencies. So in order to do that, we need to have those connections in order to fulfill all our roles uh, within the system. We have to have important connections with healthcare, important connections with community agencies and other municipal partners. And as you heard from some of the deputants, we also have to make sure that we're adequately resourced, that we have the expert staff who have the capacity to diagnose and determine those issues that are driving health needs and issues in our community. And that are, um, we also have to have that expert capacity to identify and address health threats. Thank That's you. how we fulfill our role. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, I have just a few. Um, I just want to understand, uh, Dr. Davila, your position building on your presentation. Um, is it correct that your position is that there should be, uh, and to AV, I think there's a bit of feedback on my mic, um, that there should be one public health unit in the City of Toronto within the city boundaries? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, I do believe that there should be one public health entity for Toronto with the necessary expert staff so that we can, as the local public health department, fulfill all our responsibilities and obligations to the people we serve. And is it your position that the funding model of 7525 should at the very least be maintained? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I would suggest that we do need to maintain an important role. The province has, has to play a role in respect of ensuring that the health of the population in Toronto is maintained. Uh, and if we were to see uh, upwards of a $40 million annual budget um, shortfall uh, or reduction in funding for Toronto Public Health, could you speculate on what the, would we be able to absorb those costs internally without affecting service, um, public health service? Through you, Mr. Chair, we would not be able to do that. It would inevitably have impact. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay, we are now going to move into speakers. Um, to speak first, I'll, I, I will have a motion. I'll speak, I'll speak at the end. But to speak, anybody else to speak first? Councillor Perks. So I, I want to I first uh, thank the, the people who came and made deputations here today. Uh, it was very insightful and, and, and certainly helped me clarify my thinking. I will say this, though, that uh, public health professionals are always very careful and very measured in their language. Uh, I guess it's because they, you know, they rely on an evidence-based approach and so on and so forth. I'm not. I'm blunt. This, this is not uh, a savings, it's cuts. And it will mean that people in Toronto and Ontario get sicker. And it will mean that we have to spend more money uh, keeping people in, on gurneys in, ho in hospital corridors and hallways. And that there will, uh, you know, and I, I cannot believe that anyone would ever consider this uh, in the province of Ontario where the last time uh, there were cuts to the uh, system that protect health on a public basis, we experience the Walkerton tragedy. It just shocks my mind that, that, that this would be even on the table. And I'll tell you from someone who spent four years uh, in, the, in the City of Toronto government grinding through uh, detailed budget proposals from the Board of Health and, and other places, uh, you can't cut a quarter of the budget without uh, cutting the actual delivery of services. This will mean fewer frontline healthcare workers from Toronto Public Health uh, giving people the tools to stay healthy. It will mean we will be less prepared uh, for infectious disease outbreaks or other health emergencies. It is just madness. And it's something that I think that, you know, those of us who've, who've taken the time to volunteer or uh, extend our duties as city councillors to sit on this board of health can't stand for. And it's something we should be inviting our colleagues at other boards of health across the province of Ontario to stand up against as well. I can think of very few things the province of Ontario that could have, could have done that are worse than what they've done here. And we should be calling on Torontonians and people right across the province to fight back and say, no, we're not going to let you make Ontarians get sicker. 
Thank you, Councillor Perks. Uh, next to speak, Councillor Layton. Thank you very much, uh, and and I do appreciate that the uh, our, our friends from Alpha and our our prior Ontario Medical Officer of Health for coming and sharing some insight uh, with us here. It, it it strikes me that, and I think it's been said, but I, it worth repeating. Uh, that, that we've lost sight of the, 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 the forest in this situation, that our provincial government in um, making a rather rash and, and not well thought out uh, course, of, uh, course that they've, they've, they've struck is not even thinking just a couple budgets down the road. Um, like we've heard time and time again of the cost savings and, and I think that they're very real and very well demonstrated and I can't see how uh, the, 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 the Premier and the, the government is so willingly just ignoring the enormous amount of fact here, both medical and uh, financial, uh, the, the, the evidence here. And I, I think for me, though, it, it strikes much deeper that when you look at what public health does on a daily basis, sure, reducing costs are fine, and we think of outbreaks and, and, and they, they, they feel rather distant than, than, than hitting close to home. But when, when my kids go to school, I want to know that there are programs reaching out to parents that, uh, that, that perhaps um, d don't, don't have the time or, or, or the level of, uh, of understanding about some of the illnesses uh, the chronic disease uh, and and infectious illnesses that can plague a a, a, a classroom, a, a school, and an entire city really quickly. Uh, I want to know that we've got people doing that level of education and intercept uh, to ensure that not only those kids are healthy, but so are mine. And I want to know that that the other kids in that in that school are getting a proper meal at the beginning of every day. I know it's tough getting getting my daughters to school every day, and I actually start have, having to make lunch this coming September, which will be fun. Uh, but like they, I I want to know that all their kid, all those kids are there and ready to learn, and I want to know that there's a a, a a public health nurse at that school talking about all of the important things that uh, that that those kids and those other parents need to know. I want to know that when my daughters walk down the street with, with me or with, with, with my partner, uh, that the other people that are, are forced to live on the street, that unfortunately aren't as fortunate as we are, that they have access to those life-saving services too so that they don't have to walk past people on the street that are, that are struggling to the degree that we see on a regular basis in our city. And I, I think all of, the, I, I want to go to a restaurant and not have to worry that it hasn't been inspected in, in too long, that I've got to uh, bring, a, bring some kind of tube of food for my children because that's the, that's the only thing I think is safe. Like these are all things that public health touches on on a regular basis. And uh, like if, if, if the government wants to look at finding efficiencies, you don't, you don't go after the one thing that delivers on efficiencies and savings on a regular basis. And so I, like, I, I'm, I'm pleased to support the, the motions coming forward, but, but friends, we're not going to be done here. And I hope that what, uh, what this committee takes uh, home and anyone watching uh, will, will go out and continue this dialogue in a, in a much greater, uh, greater space, saying why, why would the government so willingly put all of us and all of our kids at risk? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Any other speakers? Uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I want to thank the chair for calling this special meeting. I recognize that we've had a lot of special meetings recently, um, but considering the circumstances that are before us, I would say that um, if we need to be uh, quick and nimble on our feet, and so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for doing so, um, and also to the, to the deputants uh, for, for coming out and responding so, so eloquently and so quickly. Um, I recognize that there's a lot of information we just don't know. 
um, and uh, and that's why I believe the medical officer of health gave us as much as she could, um, but recognizing that there's a lot of details that are just simply not there, uh, which um, depending on the mindset that you're in, um, it could lead you into some very dark places of what can go wrong, and I think of all the things that, that can go wrong. Um, Toronto Public Health uh, and the agencies that work with Toronto Public Health are really our eyes and ears in the community. Uh, they are able to go into neighborhoods and work with vulnerable populations that we cannot do. Not the hospitals, not mainstream big health organizations, they can't get there but Toronto Public Health can. And that means the more vulnerable communities, the ones who are further outside of the core, who don't have access to the mainstream, uh, big in health institutions, uh, they are on the grounds working with those communities. Um, and those eyes and ears are absolutely critical. And that feedback loop means that we can actually have a fighting chance of keeping people healthy and safe. And so as I think about as my mind might go to the, some of those dark places of what happens if we don't have those supports, and more importantly, what happens when those agencies that are working with the very the most vulnerable don't have support, um, really what ends up happening is that um, the vulnerable communities don't get served. Um, when the SARS outbreak hit the city of Toronto, I remember uh, receiving a call from Dr. Sheila Bashir. I was the president of the Chinese Canadian National Council at that time, um, and it's a human rights organization. Um, why were we getting a call from the medical officer of health? Uh, she alerted us to the fact that there was discrimination stigma that was taking place in the community that certain individuals were being targeted. My mother was on a plane coming back from, from Hong Kong, and, uh, and the whole world at that point in time seemed to flip upside down because we just didn't have information. I was then meeting with um, Tony Clement, who was the Minister of Health, and again, the community and public health response, even though we were all struggling to understand what was happening, there was at least people in place to mobilize. And although there are learnings from the SARS outbreak of that time, um, the fact that they had individuals on the ground to make certain moves to to curb and uh, and provide care uh, and to actually uh, combat the outbreak as quickly as it happened, I think, um, is a testament to to when you have actors and players on the, on the ground, that meant that it was not going to affect the much larger population. And we saw um, 25,000 people uh, in Toronto being quarantined uh, just by way of transatlantic flights. Uh, the death of 44 individuals, uh, including uh, Tekla Lin, who was a personal friend of the family, who was uh, a registered nurse, and then uh, Nila uh, La Rosa, um, it could have been so much worse. And, uh, and in other places, it was worse. And in Toronto, there was a rapid response. And the, the strength of public health at that particular point in time, I, I would say, was probably on, on, on display. And so if we are going to be um, expressing our, uh, our opposition to this, and I appreciate that the language can only be so strong, on, on the motion, um, but we're going to have to follow this up with organizing and activity. And just like the 100,000 students came out of high schools uh, at, uh, at Queen's Park, we're going to have to figure out how to mobilize the hundreds of organizations that we work with through public health so that they also um, recognize, and of course they already do, um, how to move that together so we can show the same opposition because lives are at stake and uh, harm will be done if these cuts are allowed to, to carry forward and go through. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wong. Tam, any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, um, I will begin, let me begin by placing a motion uh, that has been advanced circulated, and the motion very clearly um, calls on the Board of Health and City Council, uh, for Toronto City Council, to first and foremost to affirm our support for Toronto Public Health, both for the mandate of Toronto Public Health and for the funding to oppose the cuts that have been uh, brought forward by the provincial government, both to the number of public health units across the province as well as to funding. And I think importantly uh, as well to work with the Association of Public Health Agencies in Ontario to ensure that this is not simply about our city, 
and our borders and our residents. It is also about the health and well-being of the residents of this province and this is to formally state our intention to work with the Association of Public Health Agencies to stand together. Um, I thought Dr. Mowat put it quite well when he alluded to the cycle. The cycle whereby a reduction in funding leads to an emergence of outbreaks and infectious diseases which leads to the public calls for action leading to the restoration of funding. It's short-sighted and we've seen this tale before. Uh, when we called the special meeting of the Board of Health to take place today, we anticipated that there might be something in the budget we had to respond to. I think it's sad to say that none of us expected it would be so drastic and so dangerous to think that the province would propose without any warning, without any notice and without any consultation, the closure of 25 public health units, 25 of 35 across the province. And not only to do that, to cut funding, effective 2021, a 27% cut in funding. And to note that the future, there could be future cuts to funding based on the funding model. And to bury this on page 277 of a budget. It was wrong and it was callous, yet again. And so we've heard here today from the former medical officer, chief medical officer of health from, of Ontario, to the president of the Association of Public Health Agencies of Ontario, to the former chair of the Board of Health, to our own medical officer of health. We've heard collectively in the importance of public health alongside healthcare. And whether it's testing safe drinking water quality or regulating food safety or implementing vaccines or conducting student nutrition or prenatal programs for mothers or overdose prevention in the midst of the biggest crisis of our time, public health's role saves lives today and in the future. And when you cut it, lives will be lost. You can't sugarcoat that. And we know that when you prevent unnecessary health trips of tomorrow, you save money today. Public health succeeds when its work is invisible. And so you have a province that has spoken publicly about ending hallway health care that in cutting public health is creating further hallway health care. And so the diseases we prevent today are the health care costs we save tomorrow and the lives we save tomorrow. And so when we called this meeting, I anticipated that we might have to respond because the health of Ontarians may be at risk. I did not expect that they would be at serious risk, but that's where we stand. And so we will work together both as this board, but with 34 other boards right across the province to raise our collective voices and make sure that these cuts don't proceed. Uh, with that, uh, I think we'll call for a vote and I'd ask for a recorded vote on this, please. All in favor, uh, Chair Cressy, Trustee Idy LaPride, Ida Lepretti, uh, Kate Mulligan, Councillor Perks, Peter Wong, Sue Wong, Trustee Stephanie Donaldson, Councillor Layton, Angela Johnson, and Councillor Rong Tam. All opposed, that carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, that is unanimous. Uh, our work unfortunately has just begun. Thank you very much and thank you for coming to a special meeting on such short notice.